Praise the Lord. Greetings to each one of you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, we have been covering the series uh, on the Epistle of James since February of this year, and we are at the last message of this series. And God has been gracious to allow us to cover this um, epistle verse by verse and to, uh, to be uh, under the leading of the Holy Spirit to speak to what God has for this congregation. So praise God for, uh, for his grace to enable us to do that for all these few months. Um, let us turn to James chapter 5, 19 through 20. James chapter 5, 19 through 20. I'm reading from the NLT version. My dear brothers and sisters, if someone among you wanders away from the truth and is brought back, you can be sure that whoever brings a sinner back from wandering will save that person from death and bring about the forgiveness of many sins. You know, you might have a counter this in, uh, in your daily life. You might be in a pu public place. You're probably in a supermarket or in a mall or an airport. And uh, say you're with your family or, or someone else. And, you, you know, you're focused on getting to that one aisle. You know, maybe the cookie aisle or the food court or, or the next gate in the airport. And you assume that the person that is, the people that are with you or the person that is with you is, keeping up with you and because you have this goal in mind to get to that point and and you know they're maintaining that you think they're maintaining the same pace you might be talking to the shadowy figure behind you you you're you're walking so fast and you're ready you're just wanting to get to that place and then you take a look back or you look aside and you realize that person is not with you and uh so then you know what do we do we stop and we look back and then we look to the crowds and we realize that they have been wandering away they have been lost and that happens to us quite a bit doesn't it in in our daily life so what do we do we go back right we go back trace our steps we go back to maybe the last time we saw them and sometimes we find that they were right there where they were looking at something else similarly in, the, in these two verses that we just read James is encouraging believers in the body of Christ who are in this pilgrimage together to heaven to partner with God to restore struggling believers back on this pilgrimage. You know, some of us, being the way that we are, we think to ourselves, you know what, everybody should just mind their own business and worry about their own walk. You know, this could be a reaction to how sometimes the church people judge uh, without showing mercy or grace. You know, how instead of helping, the church sometimes hurts. And, and, and that is a legitimate concern. And, and it's in my heart today to address that as we cover these two verses. So if you have your Bibles open, let's look at verse 19. We know that James is addressing this to people within the church because he says, My dear brothers and sisters, if someone among you this term brothers and sisters we need to pause a bit to understand the depth of this i think we understand this in a purely physical sense if my own biological brother and sister i call them brother or sister because we come from the same mother and father right in the same sense when in the church when we talk to call someone a brother or call somebody a sister the truth behind that is that we are coming from, we have been coming from the same source. We, we have been born by God. We have been, we have been indwelled by the same Holy Spirit. We are in fellowship with the same Holy Spirit. We have been redeemed by the same blood of Christ. And so with all these uniting factors, that is what enables us, beyond just the title of calling somebody a brother and sister, to truly sense in our heart that this is truly a brother and a sister in Christ with me. It is, a, it is, I mean, think of things of an eternity. 
this physical relationship that we have with our earthly siblings and with this earth. But when we think about the vastness of eternity, brothers and sisters, that we're going to have are those who have been bought by the precious blood of Christ. Beyond the earthly relationship, beyond the earthly, physical, brotherly, and sisterly relationships, we'll be all united together under this banner of Christ as brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. So here James is talking about if someone among you, if someone in the church wanders away, he says if, right? If someone among you, not when someone among you. Why I say, why I want to stress that is because wandering should not be normalized, but it is, and it has become normalized. It is, no, no, wandering should not become a common place when we are walking together as brothers and sisters in Christ. But it can happen. But if it happens, brothers and sisters in the church have the responsibility of bringing these people who have been wandering away back into the fellowship with God and with God's community. That's a real responsibility that is on us. So what does James say that they're wandering from? Verse 19 again. If someone among you wanders away from the truth. So if we just focus on the epistle of James, there are different ways in which James talks about, James tries to describe what is the truth. And, and as we have talked about the names of the series is doers of the word. Uh, James is very practical. James is very action-based in, in all of his prescriptions. And so he is mentioning in particular about someone who is walking in unrighteousness. It might not directly refer to somebody who has wandered from the faith, as in wandered from belief, but typically if you and I have noticed people and are, know ourselves, well, we know that that when we have, when we show behavior that is not congruent with the Word of God, when we have behavior that is not righteous in nature, it is often an indication of the fact that we have wandered away from the very faith that we hold. So, how does James characterize those who are wandering from the truth? Just as a way of reminder, we talked about a lot of different issues that James arises in, in this epistle to the Jewish dispersion, the Jewish community. He talks about what? Ungodly speech. He talks about disobedience. He talks about double-mindedness or quarreling and fights or loving riches, being arrogant and not humble and so on. So when there's a disconnect between what we believe and what we do, or if we're not doers of the word, we are wandering slowly away from the truth. So this word of truth that James talks about, he talks about the implanted word. This word of truth that is, that is implanted in our hearts transforms us. And that's the power of the word. When the word of God is preached, when we digest the word, as we meditate on the word, the word of God has the power to transform us, to change us from the inside out. And, and if the word of truth has not activated in you and me as we learn from the parable of the sower what does that mean that perhaps that word that was preached to us has been snatched away by the words or by satan it has been choked out by the worries of this world up trampled on by by the in the in the, in the streets so if, if we have not experienced a transformation of our heart through the word of truth i pray that today will be that day not tomorrow, not, not another day, but today as we are gathered here in the name of Jesus, as the word of God is being preached, as songs of worship are being sung, as we will, will have communion here in a, in a bit, as, as we have fellowship with one another, I pray that today will be the day that the word of truth will truly transform our hearts. So when we go back about verse 19, James is encouraging brothers and sisters in the church to come to the aid of of fellow church members who are wandering from the truth. He goes on to say in verse 20, he uses the word sinning. That wandering, you're sinning by wandering. Because he's encouraging brothers and sisters to do this because 
if you do it, verse 20, it says, yeah, you're doing them a great favor. This is the best thing that you can do for a fellow brother and sister in Christ. You know, as Malayalis and especially believers, we're really good at doing favors for people. I think this church is a model for that, to go beyond all effort to help people, especially in need. You know, we don't usually ask for anything back. We don't set conditions. We help without expecting anything in return. And those are all great qualities as a community that we have. But in the context of the church, the biggest favor, as I said, you can do for someone, whether it's a brother to a brother or a sister to a sister, is to help them walk with Jesus. At minimum, I say, at least don't be a stumbling block in their faith journey by hurting them or, or provoking them to anger. You know, we can analogize a good church like a good hospital. The sick come and the sick leave healed. Now, if the church is great, the healed will also be equipped to heal others. Now, if a church is like a bad hospital, the sick come and leave with broken bones and missing organs, like in some hospitals in India that's happening. So this is the example of a good set of friends carrying the brother, the burden of their friend, taking any means necessary to bring their weak friend or weakened friend to Jesus for restoration. Do you have such friends? Do you have such friends that, that when they sense that you are weak in the faith, when they sense that you are struggling with something, that they, round, they come around you to take you to Jesus, whether it's in prayer or through godly counsel, do you want to be that kind of friend? Now back to James chapter 5 verse 20. James says that if you help bring back those wandering from the truth, you are saving them from death and bring about the covering or forgiveness of many sins. Now when you read that as it is, you might ask, I am able to bring people back from death or I am able to bring about forgiveness of sins. How is that possible? Because isn't it God that, that does this? Yes, God is the one who, who saves and God is the one who, who forgives sins. But he also uses people like you and me to, in his redemptive work, whether it's to plant a seed of the word of God, whether it's to, to walk alongside, to take that person to the church or to, to, to Christ. Paul says this to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, 16, and this is our key verse of our year in pastor's message. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the, doc, on the teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Life emitting doctrine, right? That is our theme of the year. So Timothy, or Paul is telling Timothy here, keep a close watch on, on yourself and your doctrine. What you do and, and with your life and what you believe matters. There's so many warnings against those brothers and sisters who go out to try to bring uh, lost brothers and sisters in the faith or wandering brothers and sisters in the faith. They, they, there's always a warning that, that, that is given because if we get into the business of trying to find out who is struggling in the faith, we're chasing, we're, we're finding, we're hearing gossip. We're, we're like, hey, I heard this about you. You know, so you get into the business of that, that over time, you become self-righteous. You forget that you also are standing on this very same grace that this brother or sister needs. And so the warning that we know is that take heed lest you fall, that you have the propensity to fall as well, brother and sister. But I, I don't know about you, but in my book, in this life of 70, 80 years, you know, that... That's the life on this earth is like a drop in the ocean compared to our time in eternity. So partnering with God to bring back a brother or sister from the words of eternal death. That is what this death is. It's the biggest favor that I can do for someone. So may a desire rise 
within us for this kind of ministry of reconciliation. May he give us the wisdom to properly engage people in love, those, for those who are wandering, those who are struggling in the faith, those who need a helping hand, those who need a listening ear to hear our frustrations, those who need a, a strong wo a voice of guidance and direction, or those who just need an empathetic friend who just gets it, who understands what they're going through. And as I conclude, I'd like to end with one more insight, and I will invite the worship team to come forward. You know, this word wandering in the Greek is used in one other place in the New Testament, and that's in Matthew chapter 18, 12 to 14. Jesus says this, if a man has a hundred sheep and one of, the, one of them wanders away, that word is the same as the word in James, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others on the hills and go out to search for the one that is lost? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he will rejoice over it more than over the 99 that did not wander away. In the same way, it, it is not my heavenly Father's will that even one of these little ones should perish. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if James actually you know, adopted this teaching of Jesus into what he was trying to say. Jesus is ultimately our good shepherd who, who, who leaves the 99 for the one. We, we know that very well through the songs and through things that we have heard. But Jesus goes one step further. He gives us the responsibility. He helps, he, he calls us to share in that responsibility to take care of one another. And thankfully, we have pastors in the church who, who play a leading role shepherding us in the faith. So if we tie this verse in Matthew to what we've been meditating in James, the reason why God uses people in the church uh, to bring those who are wandering back in the faith is that because it is not in God's will that the wandering should perish. He wants everybody to come to the knowledge of the truth. Any time that is extended in our life, whether it's a day or an hour, it's so that we will come back to the truth, that we will repent. It is His mercy, nothing else than His mercy. And He places people in our life as means of grace to share with us His heart, His word. Sometimes we wrestle with God for direct involvement in our life. And, you know, and out of nowhere comes a church member, you know, asking, hey, how are you? You know, if it's an older uh, Brother, sister, the how are you, Mone? How are you, Mole? You know, they might ask, do you, do you have area need, needs of prayer? Do you, you know, how's your spiritual life? And, and it can seem annoying, you know. It can seem annoying when, when that question is asked. And sometimes you're like, man, why are they asking me this now? I was good until yesterday. And now this brother, sister is asking me how I'm doing. It's crazy how that timing works, right? Like every time you try to, you, you, you feel like you're right with God and things are going good. Nobody asks how you are. But the moment that you fall or, or you feel away from God, suddenly somebody comes up in the worst moment asking, how are you doing? You know, and I know how this feels because sometimes I, you know, and I've tried to do this more and more is that I try to respond back in, in a truthful way. If especially somebody I trust and I know that that will handle the, the truth I'm about to share in a, in a positive, in a godly way. It's very awkward to say that, no, I'm not doing okay. But, you know, pushing through that awkwardness and that pain and becoming transparent, it leads to healing. It leads to light coming into our life. We need to open up our heart to allow these kind of questions of love. It might seem awkward. It might seem intrusive. But when people engage us in questions to ask how we're doing see that as as means of God's grace so don't reject the means of grace that uh, uh, that God sends your way which are, which are the people in your life it might be a brother or sister in this church so let us pray Heavenly Father we thank you for this morning God we once again lift up our brother in your hands we pray, O oh God, that your healing will come upon him, O oh Lord God. Pray for everybody who will be treating him and taking care of him, Lord. We also, O oh God, lift up the word that, that you've, been, you've been speaking to us today, O oh Lord God. I pray for both the brothers and sisters who have a heart to help and heart to, 
hard to minister to those who are struggling because they themselves have, have gone through this, Lord. You have redeemed us, oh God, from this very same thing that we see our brothers and sisters going through. We also pray for those who are, God, wandering, oh God, in this earth. Lord, they have known you for a season, but now they, they're lost. And we pray, oh Lord God, that your kind and generous, your, your graceful arms, oh God, would reach them, oh Lord God. Help us to be examples of love to those who, who need a special touch, Lord God. Pray that your word, oh God, the word of truth, the implanted word will speak through us, through the man of God who will be preaching and ministering through the worship, through communion, Lord. Our hearts are open for you, oh God. We give you all the praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.